In the previous video, we unpacked the distinct differences between complex trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, more traditional PTSD. In this video, we're going to dive deeper into the underlying neurobiology of complex trauma. What creates these differences in the two diagnoses? If you haven't watched the previous video, it is of course linked below, or you can find it easily on our channel. So deep in the recesses of our brain, we have a tiny little ancient brain part called the periaqueductal gray. This little brain part is highly involved in our experience of the world and our relationship with humans and the, our ability to feel safe or unsafe with humans. Because it is so ancient, it is, of course, interacting regularly with our amygdala and in a normal, healthy, functioning brain, even in moments of anxiety stress, social awareness, or concern that, hey, is this person going to like me or not? Our periaqueductal gray will send up some flags and let us know that we have some concerns about our felt sense of safety and connection to our village. And what we know when people have experienced trauma is that this little part of our brain is overactive. It is present and guiding our sense of safety in the world and our sense of felt connection to the world around us even when we're not actively stressed or traumatized. So at rest, this little part of our brain is acting a little differently than a normal, healthy, functioning brain. And this is the reason why when people experience trauma and specifically developmental or complex trauma, they feel on edge or uneasy in relationships because this little part of our brain has learned that people might be dangerous and unsafe and those learnings are deeply encoded into these very, very primal brain parts. And of course, our little friend, Amy, the amygdala is right up there playing an important role here. Remember we talk about how our amygdala how plays a guiding role in our information processing specifically tied to how do I make sense of the world around me? Is this information threatening or not threatening? Do I need to be reactive or can I be responsive? What steps do I need to take to be safe right now? And those three core values that guide all of this. Am I safe? How can I be lovable? And how am I going to be successful in getting my core needs met? So the amygdala and the periaqueductal gray collude in this way to disrupt the way our brain is making the sense of the world and ultimately can make us feel the bulk of the time that people are inherently dangerous or unsafe and or that we need to behave in specific ways in order to earn our safety, lovability, or ability to be successful, such as engaging in fawning or people-pleasing behavior or even dissociating or self-sacrificing. So these little brain parts come together and work together in very, very important ways, ultimately defining our emotional world. And what's really cool is that even though our periaqueductal gray operates like a bodyguard for us, trying to keep us safe all the time, it's actually hardwired to seek connection and safety. It has receptors for primary neurochemicals and hormones tied into safety and connection, such as vasopressin and oxytocin. And also these links to the amygdala align it with those core values, our desire to be safe, lovable, and be able to be successful in cultivating the world we want. So in our own healing journey, we can begin to lean into these new opportunities for healing, to harness the fact that our brain and our body ultimately always want what's best for us. And we can start to give ourselves what should have been, but wasn't in our childhood through proactive self-healing, the use of self-compassion and self-love, as well as harnessing healing in your hands and those opportunities of neuroplasticity to build and sculpt your empowered brain. Um.